Hey there, everybody. I'm Jerry, and I'm here with Frank. Uh, the two of us, we built a pretty neat little app that talks to a database on the back end. But I want Frank, would you describe it to us and kind of show it off? Yeah, let me show you. So let me share my screen here. So don't judge. It's not finished, but it's a Blazor mm -hmm. application, you know, that net new Blazor. And we start creating that. And because, Jerry, you're a fan of Star Trek, is it right? Yeah, that's so right. We decided to show that and using a database full of information about Star Trek. And here I have, I built a very simple uh, view page sharing like, okay, different series and the characters so like Spock and Jean-Luc Picard. I feel like I'm the only one because I speak French who could say that correctly. It sounds right when you say it, yeah. <laughs> and Jerry provided me two different endpoints. So REST, regular, mm -hmm. like more, more. I think it's very, people know that. And also a GraphQL. Uh, so because I couldn't decide which one to use, I decided to use those and I create two different pages. But before we go and look into the code, how I build that Blazor application, I want Jerry to spend more time explaining us how he did that API, because I think it's really interesting. What did you use to create that API? I use Data API Builder. All right, so it's unbelievable, Frank, too. Let me start by just talking about how accessing a database on the back end is just what everybody has to deal with. So uh, you have a SQL server, you have a client, how are they going to talk to one another? Eventually, you get to this point where you're designing a solution where I need a data API in the middle. And so most developers are like, I guess I have to build it. I guess I have to find the right framework. I have to find the right way to do it, build my repositories, my unit test, put it in my CI CD pipeline, and just allow for that code kind of code base to grow so much because you have this data a this data API. Well, that's what data API builder is trying to get away from, making it so that you have an engine that you can use that gives you all the capabilities you need without needing all the code. In fact, the only thing you really need is a JSON file. And the place to put that JSON file is what we're going to talk about now. So like every developer, you're going to have a repository. So in this case, we have a GitHub repository. And so this is your repo. And in when it comes to deploying DAB the way we're doing it today using static web apps, you only need a single file. It's absolutely amazing. So this is you, by the way, you're looking pretty good and you put this one file into your repository. So let me pull up my repository just to show you what it looks like. The repository starts off completely empty and I don't add a bunch of code. There's no C sharp, there's nothing. It's just this one JSON file. Now, I do have an HTML file, just an index file. It doesn't have anything in it, but I need that for static web apps because that's a requirement. But I have this one folder, swa-db-connections. That's where the JSON file for Data API Builder is. So let me go into that and show you. Here it is. It's named static web, staticwebapp.database.config.json. If I go into it, it's just a standard JSON file that you would have built for uh, Data API Builder anywhere else. But we're using static web apps which means we want the web app service to handle everything for us. So it's worth doing it this way. So it starts by just saying what your data source is. Mine's a SQL server. And I make sure that I'm reading from an environment variable because that's what I'm allowing for static web apps to inject into my container when it's all said and done. And then down here, it's nothing new. It's just a list of uh, the tables that I'm using. So first I have like the actor table, and then down here I'll have the character table as well. And a couple of other things because there's a whole schema here, but we're just interacting just kind of for fun to show off how easy it is to build a data API on top of your database using static web apps. Okay, so that what have we done so far? We've built the repository, and then I'm gonna go into Azure in my portal, and I'm gonna create a static web app service. It's free, I just go in and create it, and the first thing I do as I'm going through the creation process, it asks me where my repository is and automatically creates the GitHub actions that will take the code I, I put into it, into the repository, and move it into static web apps. In fact, let me just say that again, nobody, uh, puts files into a static web app, they instead put them into a repository and then the actions move them in for us. That's all handled for you. It's all magic because static web apps injects and adds these actions for you in your repository. Okay, now what do we do? Well, what's awesome is we go into the static web app and we configure it. There's only one thing to configure, Frank. There's only a single thing you need to do. So I, if you create a... Um, a stat, this is mine, a static web app. Um, you can go in and there's a tab down here or an option down here at the on the left that is the new database connection feature. And if you go in there, all it really asks you is to create, and I've already done it right here, you can see it, 
All it asks you to do is to create basically all the information for your connection string. It takes all of that information pointing to any database like Postgres, SQL, MySQL, or Cosmos that's in Azure database. And it, it takes all the connection information that you need and stores it safely inside static web apps. The reason it does that is so you don't put your connection string all inside your repository where you would never want to put your secrets, right? It keeps it safe inside static web apps. So now I have my JSON file in static web apps. I have my connection string in static web apps. What happens next? Nothing that I need to do. Everything's just handled by static web apps for me. And what happens is it automatically deploys the container it automatically injects my connection string and sets it up and invokes DAB to be my new data API on top of it. So here's my API, completely handled by the way because of static web apps. And now it is the thing that's talking to whatever my backend database is. And that cool client that you just created, Frank, that guy talks directly to my API and interacts with, just like you said, either a REST API or a graph API, whichever one you want. And it's not a choice of one or the other, you get both. It's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. What do you think? I think I really like it. It's very useful, very easy. And since it goes so fast, we still have plenty of time to go back into the code. So let me share my screen here. So now let's switch to the, the .NET side of it. So I'm sure. in Visual Code, where I build that Blazor application I was showing before. And you, you, uh, you, you show um, different API. And I want to show for the, I'm using for the GraphQL, I'm using a specific query here. Like here, we, we can see it. I created a folder and I use, uh, I want to I wanna say the name correctly. So Strawberry Shake for Blazor, and it's a very <laughs> opponent. I really like That's it. That's right. It's, it's actually worth pointing out that Strawberry Shake is, is the same group that also makes uh, Hot Chocolate. So Hot Chocolate is the framework that we use inside Data API Builder to expose it from the server so you can have a graph endpoint. Strawberry Shake is that what you would use on the client side to interact with that graph endpoint. It makes it super easy to use. Indeed, it was. Like now I understand way better why it, it works so well. <laughs> so let me show you the, the this page I create using the graph um, API. And it's very low code because Strawberry Shake create for me, based on that schema of the, the API, create for me objects. So I could just say, hey, Star Trek client, and I ask, give me the character by series and and that's it everything was created by, for me so i could just use it so with dependence injection i had a, a reference to the schema those classes created now i could use it in my in my code and here it is like very basic looping through creating that uh, that table that's for graphql that's pretty neat and i mm -hmm. i did show you also i use rest so same thing, same table here I'm looping through. It's a little bit more code for REST. Let me just show here a little bit more code. So for REST, because there's no relationship between the, 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 the entities, the table, I had to make three queries. So we can see here I have series, I have character, and I have that relationship table that you create in your database. So I did that, and after that, I could have been more eloquent at it, but it, it works. So like a bunch of loops and if to rebuild yeah. that information and then display it. So it was very easy to consume. And now I could deploy that website somewhere in Azure. So consuming the API, very easy to, to use and very simple. And I had a lot more time to focus on the app instead of like building an API. Database API are like very straightforward. So it, a tool like that API builder is fantastic for that. Yeah. And it's just one of those things that's meant to be, well, it's just meant for developers. It has a lot of developer tooling built into it. We talked about hot chocolate and strawberry shake. It also has banana cake pop. All these names are so hilarious, but it's almost like the swagger that you would use for rest. Uh, banana cake pop is that for GraphQL and it's right there. So developers can interact with it. We have open API caching and a lot of other features that really a lot of enterprise endpoints demand before they even get started. So it's really a great tool. It's open source. You can go to the repository if you'd like to and just review the code, download it, get one of the latest releases, or just point to the container and use that container. 
or use it inside static web apps like we did here today. It's such an easy thing to get started with. You could have a POC done by the end of the day, showing your manager how cool this is and the direction you want to go from this point forward. So it's a really cool thing to say that you've taken a, almost a third of the code base out of your solution and made it so much easier to use. So Frank, uh, it was cool to put this together. It was neat and fun to work with you about it. And thanks for letting me show off Dab. It was awesome. We'll put all the link in the description so you could start looking at it. So thank you for watching.